Let's get back to another strong position and talk about shortstops. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, February 9th. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today we have our 2023 shortstop preview, a very fun position. Lots of names to talk about. Lots of really great names to talk about, which is just a nice, a nice breath of fresh air compared to second base, which was yesterday's podcast. Let's start things off with a little outlook and strategy as we have done for each of these. Chris, we'll start with you. How would you describe this position this year? Shortstop, 2023. Deep and star-studded. It's, I think, the best position in fantasy right now. Um, I mean, I guess outfield probably has a higher number of raw players who are useful, but actually it's probably pretty close. Uh, shortstop is just ridiculously stacked with very, very good, well-rounded players. You're going to see probably a dozen or more go inside of the top 100 in any of your given drafts, which makes for some really interesting strategy. I, you know, I, I'm starting to think that while positional scarcity is a big deal with regards to second and third base, one thing I'm noticing with my drafts is it's more a positional surplus at shortstop. I find like when I happen to take a shortstop early, as I did in the head to head points draft we did last week, when I took Trey Turner eighth overall, I end up having to just keep passing over the top player in my rankings over and over and over because so many shortstops around the you know eighth to twelfth round range especially just are so much better than every other hitter going in that range and so it creates some really interesting strategy options because you know looking back at that one I think uh Freddie Freeman went one pick after Trey Turner probably should have taken Freddie Freeman I mean it's a points league so that might have been the case anyway but I probably should have taken Freddie Freeman because then I would have been able to get you know, Freddie Freeman and Xander Bogarts instead of Trey Turner and Christian Walker or whatever it ended up being. So I think it's it's a position that you may have to make some tough decisions at. And I feel pretty confident saying, Chris, this is probably a better position for Roto. There's yeah. obviously going to be, be good players, very good players for head-to-head -head points leagues. But for the reasons you mentioned, it's star-studded. We're going to get power. We're going to get speed. But also, mm -hmm. a roto draft with a middle infield spot, it allows you to, if you want to double down and take another yep. one of those awesome shortstops that just keep falling to a great value, you have the luxury no. to do that. You can take three the, of the them. Tr the truth is, or five of them. Uh, probably not because there are other people drafting too. But they're, like the, the thing is, even if you're talking about a head to head lineup, what it basically comes down to first base or shortstop, which you're going to fill your utility spot with. I feel like you're probably not taking an extra outfielder because that's a disaster. Second base, third base, same thing. Catcher, obviously not because, you know, the playing time isn't the same there. Um, so it, it, unless you get Shohei Otani or, or JD Martinez mm -hmm. late in the draft, it, it's probably going to be either a shortstop or a first baseman filling your utility spot. Those are clearly the deepest positions, I think. I would I, I I do think that shortstop did suffer to a small degree, a much smaller degree than second base with the um the elimination of the juiced ball. Obviously, they tend to be smaller, more agile players than the the hulking sluggers we see at other positions. So they kind of suffered from this cumulative power decline uh, that we saw at second base as well. It's just that they were so star studded prior to that, that we don't feel the drop as much in fantasy, but you look at, you know, some of the standouts at the position, Bo Bichette, his power for five months of the year was down considerably. It took a massive surge in September to get his numbers back to where we expected them to be. Uh, Tim Anderson's power declined. Xander Bogart's power declined. Like there's, there's not really a, th a clear 30 Homer guy at this position anymore with the exception of Corey Seager and, you know, obviously Tatis and O'Neill Cruz, who we haven't seen play a full season. We haven't seen T Tatis played in a while. We haven't seen Cruz played at all, uh, but we hope they have that. We think they have that kind of power potential as well. But you're not going to see that big power potential up and down the position anymore. Of course, there are more base dealers here than at first base. But I would say that while 
first base and shortstop are so deep in the mid range of the draft that you should probably just wait to fill either spot there. First base is also deep late in the draft in a way shortstop isn't shortstop. If you play in a 12 team head to head league, let's say you're probably not going to notice the drop off. You're, you know, the draft's going to end before you get to that point. But if you play in anything deeper than that, a 12 team roto league with the middle infield spot, certainly something 15 teams are deeper. There is such a thing as waiting too long at shortstop because once they're gone, there's nothing left. It's, and it's not like third base, man. Like I, I, I could say the same at third base, but that happens early in the draft. It's late in the draft and short stuff yeah. when it happens. But when it happens, like you're just finished at the position. There's nothing more to go for. To put some numbers to that, uh, I, I had that stat yesterday where we went from 17 second basemen hitting 20 home runs in 2021 to, I think, six last season, I think was the number. Uh, similarly, in 2021, there were 20, there were in 2021, there were 17 players who played at least 20 games at shortstop who had 20 home runs. In 2022, that number was nine. So almost halved. That's like Scott said, it wasn't as dramatic as second base, but there definitely was a uh, a drop off. It's funny. 2015, there were two sh- shortstops who had 20 plus home runs. There were 15 the following year. That's wild. Yeah, I think more than any other position, and you guys have hit on this, you just kind of let the value come to you at the shortstop position. But as Scott mentioned, be careful because once we get to around Carlos Correa, Jeremy Pena in the ADP, which we'll talk about, there is a pretty big talent drop off after that. 13 shortstops as of now going inside of the top 100 picks, according to Fantasy Pros ADP. The next closest infield position is first base with eight. So 13 shortstops in the top 100, eight first basemen, in the top 100 picks, you consider Bobby Wood Jr. might be drafted for third base. Tommy Edmond might be drafted for second base. They also have shortstop eligibility. Even with that, you're talking about 11 shortstops being inside the top 100. So it is a very fruitful position. And let's jump into ADP. And we'll start with one name that consistently goes at the top of drafts in a roto or categories league, probably a top three, top five pick. Chris mentioned we did head-to-head points last week, and Trey Turner slips a little bit to the end of the first round. But as of now, the ADP is two overall, second overall, and he's tied with Jose Ramirez for the top ADP right now. And Trey Turner, incredibly consistent, has not finished lower than six overall in Roto each of the past three years, still averaged 3.4 fantasy points per game. It's got a five-category contributor. Uh, I don't know that... He's not a huge help in terms of home runs, but he definitely doesn't hurt you. I would still project him for at least 20 home runs. And now that he's on the Phillies, a team where I I think he could lead off, you know, in in LA, he was batting third for that team. Leading off of the Phillies, I think we could get back to like 35, maybe even 40 steals for Trey Turner this year. Uh, Well, I I mean, the fact, like, I'm... It's hard for me to put a specific number on steals expectations for any player because of you know, the, the, the new rule with pitchers being limited to two pick up pickoff throws for a bat. I think it could just change the, the landscape so much that I, I don't want to put a specific number on it, but yes, I, I think that Trey Turner relative to the league as a whole could end up running more with the Phillies than he did with the Dodgers. Ultimately, it probably doesn't mean anything to me because there's no way I'm going to draft Trey Turner. Like, if if he is in the conversation to go number one overall for the majority of people, uh, like he's clearly going to be drafted before I'm taking him because I'm going to take Jose Ramirez before him to sure up third base early, or I'm going to take one of the top five outfielders ahead of him. So, or is it top four? Trey Turner's my number six overall player. In yeah, Mookie, so I, I don't him, I don't right? have him. I don't have him in this. You know, I, I don't have him in that number one overall conversation. There's no way I'm getting him. Yeah, I was going to say, if you have Mookie Betts ranked ahead of him in Roto, then yeah, you're probably not going to get Trey Turner because it kind of feels to me at least that there's this consensus top five in a categories league, which includes Trey Turner, Jose Ramirez, Julio Rodriguez, Ronald Acuna, and Aaron Judge mm-hmm. in some kind of order. It doesn't have to be that order, but that just kind of feels like the top five for me. But that's not the case for Scott, so he's probably not yeah. going to end up with him. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what Chris was saying. Like, on just a pure statistical level, Trey Turner is 
you know, he belongs with that group. That's fine. But if you fill your shortstop spot in round one, then you're passing up a lot of value there later. And meanwhile, you're probably settling for a dud at one of those positions that you have to fill early, um, especially outfield and third base. The, in case anyone's wondering about the move over to Philly, it is a lineup downgrade. Obviously, the Dodgers were first in run scored by a lot last season, 847, exactly 100 more runs scored than the Phillies, who were seventh on that list. Uh, both ballparks were top seven in park factors for right-handed batters over the past three years. The Phillies actually a little bit more aggressive on the base path, so there's a little bit of a give and take here. I think the counting stats probably come back a little bit, but maybe we see... Trey Turner run a little bit more now that he is with the Phillies. Three names going in the early to mid second round. We're going to save Bobby Witt Jr. for the third base preview because, frankly, we don't have that many exciting players to talk about at that position. So we're going to save yeah. Bobby Witt. Uh, part of this, I, I have yet to see anybody draft him for as a shortstop this year. And I don't. Want to so should I that. should I take him out of the bus discussion for shortstop? <laughs> Uh, I mean, technically, he has shortstop eligibility. He's probably going to play shortstop for the Royals, for whatever it's worth. Um, but, yeah, for fantasy, you, you probably want to use Bobby Witt as a third baseman. Bo Bichette has an ADP of 15.5, and Fernando Tatis has an ADP of 16. So you likely need to decide between these two if you want some power and speed and you want a shortstop early on in your drafts. Chris, it was a weird season for Bo Bichette, uh, one that he really needed a monster September to, to help the overall numbers. From September 1st on, Bichette hit 406, seven homers, four steals, and 1105 OPS in 32 games. But overall, I mean, if you just compare the numbers from 2022 to 2021, yeah. there's not really a lot that was different. You know, I think he was inefficient on the base paths, but he still kind of just feels like that same player from the year before. This is one of those things where the process of having Bo Bichette on your team last year was very frustrating. Yes. But for the purposes of projecting him forward, I don't really care that the shape of the season was weird, you know, that it was heavily backloaded. Although, to be fair, it was more that he was just dreadful in April, 535 OPS in the month of April. From that point on, like his OPS, he wasn't amazing, but it was the September making up for the April rather than the September making up for like the whole season. I feel like he wasn't great the rest of the year, but he was closer to where we hoped he would be outside of April. And generally speaking, when projecting forward, I I, I pretty much view him like I did last year. I, I didn't really like him. As he, I mean, he was like a top five pick last year, right? I didn't like that. I wasn't yeah, on board little, with that. Uh, yeah, a, de a clear first rounder and, you know, top eight, something like that. Um, but I don't really view him all that differently than I did this time a year ago. I think he's a, a fringe first rounder in a 15 team league, and I'm happy to have him on my team. I think the, the counting stats will probably bounce back a little bit, um, not to the 223 combined runs in RBI that he had in 2021. But I think he's a threat for a hundred of each. The, so speed, the speed was a little bit weird, Scott. I mean, 13 steals, eight caught stealing. So was not very efficient and just 52nd percentile sprint speed for Bo Bichette. So mm -hmm. that's something that's in the back. Well, of yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to for me. I, I feel like Bo Bichette's getting too much benefit of the doubt. Like I, I you know, obviously I follow other fantasy content producers and I see what they're putting out and you know, they're, they're tearing Bo Bichette like with Trey Turner and Fernando Tatis. And I'm like, I, I, you know, I think his most likely scenario is probably closer to Francisco Lindor and Corey Seager. If, if we can't count on court, if we can't count on Bo Bichette being an elite base, like a, a high end stolen base source, like he was two years ago. And considering he was 13 for 21 on steals last year, I don't think we can count on him being a high-end steel, steel source. Then what Well, what makes him so much better than Corey Seager? I, I think the difference, specifically with Seager and Lindor, is he doesn't have the one flaw that those two guys do, which is Seager, you're going to get no steals. Like Even if Bo Bichette isn't a great source of steals, I think 15 is a reasonable expectation. Yeah, but and Lindor, you, you might get a dozen more home runs from Seager. You might, yeah. And but like I think everything else will be fairly close. But Lindor, he's 
going to be not a drain on your batting average, but relative to Boba Shett, like I think everything about Boba Shett and Francis Gillandor will probably be very close. Boba Shett's probably going to hit 20 to 30 points of batting average better. And he is one of those guys who hits 290 every year. And I think he's led the AL and hits each of the past two seasons because this is one of those times when walking, not walking is actually a good thing because he gets a huge, that, that denominator uh, in the, in the AB's column is really big. And so it makes him even more impactful for batting average than he otherwise would be. Okay. I agree with both but, of you. Actually, I, I think Bichette, Scott, you're right. Bichette is closer to Lindor than he is yeah. to someone like Trey Turner. But I also agree with Chris that I, I do think there's going to be a pretty big disparity in the batting average between those two. A 20 to 25 point difference in batting average, let's say. It is an extra 20 to 25 points in batting average from your shortstop worth at the very start of the draft 15 picks. And, and not just 15 picks, but... The range of fifth, the only range of 15 picks where you can get a stud third baseman, let's say, you know, like Rafael Devers or Manny Machado or Austin Riley. If Those guys might draft, all be gone, then, though. If, if potentially, but you know, just looking at ADP and, and from my own drafting experience, a lot of times Bobachet goes ahead of one or all of those guys. Um, is that worth the, the 20 to 25 points in batting average from your shortstop worth passing up your one and only chance? to get a third baseman of anywhere close to that caliber. And I say, no way. <laughs> like that's that's I, I don't I don't think Bo Bichette really belongs in this discussion anymore. Just like on a on a you know apples to as an apples app to apples comparison. Yes, I prefer him to Francisco Lindor, but not by as much as it seems like the consensus does. And I, I would much rather have Fernando Tatis for for one. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about Fernando Tatis. His ADP is 16, so again, you likely have to make the decision between Tatis and Bo Bichette. The last time we saw Fernando Tatis, he finished as the fifth overall player in just 130 games back in 2021. 282 batting average, 42 homers, 25 steals. The stat cast numbers are just ridiculous. 939 average exit velocity. That was 98th percentile. And when you look at his max EV and sprint speed, both 96th percentile or better. So just power and speed. He's a freak athlete, Fernando Tatis. Since then, he's injured his wrist in a motorcycle accident last offseason. He had surgery to repair a fractured scaphoid bone. He was getting ready to return in August. He got hit with a, an 80-game PED suspension, had his partially torn labrum in his shoulder repaired in September, and then had a second wrist operation in early October. <laughs> Those dang ringworms, you yes. know? Yeah, that's how it all started, right, Chris? Uh, to to help that wrist hold up long term. So the upside is immense, gentlemen. But you're t I just read off all the different injuries and surgeries and PED suspensions. And we have to wait for him to return on uh, April 20th. Hopefully he's good to go by then. But, Chris, we haven't seen this guy play baseball in, like, mm -hmm. almost two years. And... He has all these injuries to overcome too. It's it's a lot of risk. I don't want to downplay it. It's a substantial amount of risk or uncertainty or variance or whatever word you want to use to describe it. Some of it, I, I don't really like. Personally, I don't really hold the PEDs against him. I don't think it's like, I think it's unlikely that Fernando Tatis was using steroids the first three seasons of his career, finally got caught when he wasn't playing. And now he's going to be some like greatly diminished version of himself. I've seen that suggested. And I, I think that's unlikely. I think the explanation that he was using steroids to try to get back or PDs or whatever, like I, I think that tracks. I think he was, you know, trying to get back from a dumb injury, a I, dumb self-inflected injury. And let me just inter like, interject. Like if, even if it is true, he was using PEDs from the beginning. I'm not sure that matters. Well, either based you on tend the to history keep those games. Yeah. Yeah. Based on the history of guys coming back from PEDs. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, the thing is. He might be the best player in baseball. He might be the best player in fantasy. I, I think if he's right, he almost certainly is the best player in fantasy. Just the 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 enormity of the skill set, the breadth of the ways in which he helps you. I mean, Number five player in 2021, I feel like that almost undersells it because this is what he did in 130 games. 
282, 99 runs, 42 homers, 97 RBI, 25 stolen bases. He's and and that wasn't like an outlier for him. He was basically that good in 2020 and 2021. The problem is we've never seen him play more than 130 games in a major league season. He had the shortened 2020 season, obviously. 2019, I think it was the the shoulder issue. The shoulder issue was an issue, was a problem in 2021 as well. Hopefully, surgery helped fix that. I'm willing to take him in the second round. I'm willing to take him in the early second round. I think he might be the best player in fantasy from the minute he steps back on the field, but we don't know how he's going to react to all of this. You know, there, there were harsh words uh, for him in the dugout uh, in the clubhouse when, when the steroid uh, uh, suspension was announced, you know, he's going to have to earn his, the trust of his teammates and all that stuff that, we don't necessarily think about all that often, but matters. The human element is a part of it, but there's no player. I I, I don't think there's like, I guess Aaron judge, you know, has, yeah. has and the a, same kind of upside. League, in a points league. Yeah. I probably judge and Tatis are, are contending for number one overall player. But as speaking as somebody who is completely sold on judge and Roto number one, uh, that would change if, if Tatis looks like Tatis when on, he does on, get back on April 21st, Fernando Tatis might be the number one player in, Roto, in the yeah. Roto rankings. And I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I would say I'm more optimistic, even though it's multiple uh, events that Tatis is coming back from. I'm, I'm more optimistic about his chances of just being himself again than I was about Ronald Acuna at this time a year ago, because, and I think that's, you know, a fair comparison because they're missing, you know, Tatis is going to be missing about the same amount of time at the beginning of the year as we were expecting Acuna to. And if they have, you know, similar upside. They both um, get mentioned as possible best players in, in fantasy at times. And um, they were being drafted in the same range. So I, I want to be able to draft more of Tatis in that range than I actually end up drafting him. And I hate to you know, beat a dead horse here. Wait, are you taking a third baseman there? It's the only chance to get a quality third baseman, and I just can't pass it up for the upside of Tatis. I think the only scenario in which I end up drafting Tatis, talking, you know, a, a typical snake draft, is if I happen to be fortunate enough mm -hmm. to get Jose Ramirez in round one, and then Tatis lasts long enough into round two that I can pair him with with Ramirez. I think that's the only scenario where it's going to happen for me. Okay. But in terms of the risk, God, it sounds like if he falls to the right point, you're, you're okay doing it. Drafting Fernando Tatis. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, look, I'm trying to think of another scenario where it could happen. So let's say in round two, Machado Devers and Riley are all already gone. It's a shallower league. So I'm not, quite so willing to reach for Nolan Arenado that early. Maybe I can hope he'll last around my round three pick. Then I might take Tatis in that scenario too. But it's it's an exciting pick to make in round two for sure. Uh, and we're actually going to get to see him in spring training, unlike mm -hmm. Acuna. So yeah. that, I don't know how long he's going to last in round two, to be perfectly honest. He might, by the, by the, by the uh, peak of draft season, Tatis may be a surefire first rounder. Yeah, I think we see him hit a couple home runs in spring training. If he looks like himself, he, he's probably pushing or or even getting into that first round. That is Fernando Tatis. I agree, Scott. I think it's probably the cop-out answer for me, but the more the shallower the league is, the more likely I am willing to take the risk on Fernando yeah, Tatis. That's, yeah, Just, always risk is much easier to take in shallower leagues, for sure. Yeah, 10 and, and 12 team, head-to-head points leagues, anything like that. Let's drop down to the third round where we find just one name, and it is Francisco Lindor with an ADP of 29.5. Paid off in a big way. He finished 12th overall in Roto, 3.2 fantasy points per game. People remember last year, if you were uh, if you were here with us, if you were listening, I loved Lindor, and I drafted a lot of Francisco Lindor. It's funny how these things work, because now I don't know that I'm going to be drafting much Francisco Lindor, because if you look at his 2021, it seemed like he was very unlucky, and he mm -hmm. underperformed a lot of his numbers. And then last year, it seems like he was kind of lucky, and he kind of overperformed a lot of his numbers. Now, Maybe Lindor is just one of those players where, you know, he can just get the best out of his skill set regardless and, you know, just don't worry too much about the stat cast numbers. But, Chris, given the price tag, 
and the opportunity cost, you know, you're passing up again on third base or second base or something like that. I like the player. I feel like Lindor might be a touch overvalued now this year. Yeah, it's really interesting that his expected stats were actually a decent amount better in 2021 than they were in 2022. I... I think he's fine. I think there's probably some regression here and, and quite possibly to the counting stats as well. Um, but I, I have no problem with him at this price. It's again, not a, like, like you guys said, not a huge priority, probably not someone I'm going to end up drafting too much of, but it's not an anti Lindor position by any means. And like yes. you said, just 55th percentile in sprint speed, which seems lower than I thought it was. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't. I, I, I don't, I don't. You know, he maybe he'll get to twenty steals with with stolen bases easier to come by now. But yeah. I don't think he's going to be uh, relative to the position as a whole a huge base dealer. I think he's just going to be a nice help in mm-hmm. the category, um, kind of like I think Bichette's going to be. I uh, agree with Chris in that. Like, I have no objections to taking Lindor this year. I, I did last year, and you know. It, was, it ended up being the wrong stance. Uh, I, I think he's basically worth his ADP, but it's it's more an issue of you know fitting him into my needs. Like just just his his place on the draft board is um, makes it a tough fit at the point where he's going. Like if things play out the way I want them to, I'm either taking a second base then where he's going or uh, I'm taking an outfielder or maybe even I'm taking my first starting pitcher. I don't know, but I'm probably not looking to take shortstop at that point. So don't see myself with a lot of Lindor. Let's drop down about 30 picks. One name going in the fifth round. That is Corey Seager with an ADP of 59. Guess what? He finished 59th overall in Roto last year. Great head to head points league option. I know there were some YouTube comments yesterday asking for, more strategy surrounding head-to-head points, which I feel like we kind of hit on, but maybe we could do a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I got that on Twitter too. Like, uh, look, head-to-head points is my favorite format. I, I would talk, if if you if I could, I'd talk about nothing but head-to-head points. The, but. the thing for me, and look, I don't want to disparage points either because I love that format. That's how I started playing fantasy baseball. But to me, yeah, me too. there's just not as much strategy mm-hmm. involved, right? Like, you take hitters with good plate discipline who are in good lineups who are going to get a lot of plate appearances. That's Blasphemy. oversimplifying it. Last me, Frank. But well, I it's it's not that. It, it's not even. You don't even have to get into that. It's just who scores the most points. There's you know, more, like it's more it's, strategy. No, I think that when come on, no, no, but, but like on. which, which teams? You're, you're, no, no, no. But which team scores the most points is going to win. So like the strategy yeah. is like there's strategy in team building in a head-to-head points league, but. That same strategy also exists in a roto league, but you also have to balance the five categories in, that, in a way that had like, I, yes, I, but the evaluation of players is sure at times very different. Yes, Corey um, Seager is better than in a head to head points league. For yeah. example, sure, to further my Bo Bichette point from earlier, head to head points leagues 2.98 for Bichette last yeah. year. That's compared to 3.21 for Lindor. That's compared to 3.07 for Corey Seager, 2.91 for Dansby Swanson. So, like, you know, from if you're looking at that format, points per game, Bichette very clearly is a part of that tier rather than the one Yeah, Bichette is we don't, much we don't need more... need to relitigate Bichette. I'm just, Bichette's kind of a compiler. You know, even, even in Roto, you know, a, a big part of his draw is he hits at the top of a very, very good lineup. Yeah, yeah, very. Uh, look, I'm not gonna call him Whit Merrifield. He's better than Whit Merrifield, but he has uh, well, a whiff of Whit Merrifield. Let's let's say that for uh, both. Peak Whit Merrifield was a pretty good player. Of course he was. Uh, Corey Seager, by the way, his first season in Texas was a productive one. You wouldn't know it by the 245 batting average, but a career high 33 home runs and underperformed his expected stats by a lot. 245 batting average. That was a 283 xba according to Statcast. 455 slug. 510 X slug. And according to Sports Info Solutions, Seeger lost 25 hits to the shift last season. Guess what? We've got the shift restrictions. I think it just works out so perfectly for Corey Seeger. So, Scott, even in a roto league, I don't mind it if you get your steals early and you kind of feel good about the balance of where you're at, at in, in the fifth round of a draft. Totally fine drafting Seeger there, but I love him in a headset points league too. 
I love him in either one. He's he's somebody who uh, I, I might go the extra round for and fill this deep position a little early for because I've been saying for several years now that Corey Seager has first round Freddie Freeman type upside, and I and and while I've guessed wrong before that he was about to make good on it this year, I think he's about to make good on it because a He's coming off a season where he stayed healthy all the way through and proved that he could sustain that 30 homer power production over a full season. So that's, you know, he's checked off that box. He did hit a career low 245 despite entering the year as a career 297 hitter. That alone would suggest a bounce back in batting average is likely. But yes, you bring up the his struggles against the shift last year. He entered last year with a career 336 BABIP against the shift, and yet somehow it dropped to 242. Terrible. So did teams just figure out how to position Corey Seager perfectly? Maybe, but it's probably a moot point now. Basically, everybody who's dug into the data agrees that Corey Seager, uh, just going off last year's stats, is going to be the single biggest beneficiary of the shift ban. So we're talking about a potential 300 hitting 30 homer shortstop which, you know, is, is Freddie Freeman-like first-round caliber production. I do, Scott, you're being too hard on yourself because, like, he's already done this. I, I think this is the best case for Corey Seager. In 2020 and 2021, he was the guy we're expecting him to be. He, You didn't really notice it because, one, 2020 was a shortened season. He had yeah, 15 was, homers in 60, in 60 yeah. games, yeah. but... 2021, he only played 95 games. He had, I think it was a hamstring injury, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, you put those two seasons together, he hit 306 with 31 homers. Like, I'm not saying he's going to do that, but that's well within the realm of possibility. Yeah, he's already he done it. I, I don't really think, like, kind of think we spent too much time making the case for Corey Seager. The case for Corey Seager should be self-evident to anyone who knows baseball. Yeah, I, I think you could get a... An Austin Riley, Nolan Arenado type season that we just mm -hmm. saw last year where those guys finish as, you know, top 25 players. I think we can get that out of Corey Seager uh, this year. Let's move down in ADP. This is where it really starts to get bunched up. We've got four names between picks 70 and 90. Dansby Swanson, ADP of 73.5. O'Neill Cruz at pick 82. Xander Bogarts at 83.5. Wander Franco at 87. Chris, this is a really interesting group. Uh, Swanson goes over to the Chicago Cubs, and he's coming off a huge breakout season where he was the 13th overall player in Roto Leagues last season, still averaged 2.9 fantasy points per game. O'Neill Cruz is that physical freak, that stat cast darling. He's got tools for days, struggles with strikeouts and against left-handed pitching. Uh, Xander Bogarts had a down year. Now he's moving from a favorable Fenway Park to Petco. You know, how's it going to work out for him? Uh, and then Wander Franco... I just don't know what to make out of him. Honestly, he's one of the hardest players for me to rank. I, he was injured. He was riddled with injuries last year, but he was formerly the top prospect in the game. And I don't want to give up on a player like that. So it seems to assume to do something like that. Uh, do you find yourself targeting anyone of these four in this group? Oh yeah. I, I think uh, part of the, part of the problem for me is I've usually drafted a shortstop by now I've noticed. And I end up with, Dansby Swanson, O'Neill Cruz, Xander Bogarts, and Wander Franco in some order, along with Tim Anderson and, and Carlos Correa as like six of the top eight players in my queue for like a four round stretch. Right. Because uh, I think they're all awesome players. I think there's huge upside with pretty much all of them. Maybe not Bogarts and Dansby Swanson. I think they kind of are what they are, but what they are is pretty good. Um, I'm most likely, I think, to draft O'Neill Cruz of this group just because freakish upside I, I tweeted this out and I, I talked to frank about it before the season but if you want like a direct summation of why o'neill cruz is so much fun uh for the first time in the Statcast era which goes back to the 2015 season 2022 was the first time that john carlos stanton didn't have the hardest hit ball in the majors and it's not because john carlos stanton stopped hitting the ball hard it's because o'neill's o'neill cruz hit the hardest recorded ball in Major League history. I don't know if it was the hardest hit baseball in Major League history. Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire used to hit the ball pretty freaking hard, but <laughs> certainly the hardest since we've been tracking it. It's like 122 miles per hour or something. Amazingly, it was a single off the wall because yep. he hit it too hard. Um, yep. <laughs> but yeah, like this is a guy who... 
you can't really put a ceiling on what he's capable of. Like we just saw the 99th percentile outcome for Aaron judge who has a skill set like O'Neill Cruz's, at least as a hitter, you know, judge obviously played discipline much better than O'Neill Cruz has shown in the majors, but the minor league numbers are actually strikingly similar, but like 45 Homer upside 25 stolen bases within the realm of possibility. Anytime you're talking about that, you know, of this group, O'Neill Cruz is the only one I could legitimately see being a first round pick next year. Yeah, that's within the range of outcomes. It, it, it could be a first round type season from O'Neill Cruz. It could be, I don't think it's crazy to say you, you could drop him at some point throughout the season. It, you know, if it, if it maybe, but really like, early. I think the power and the speed are going to be so useful that you probably still want to hang on to him. Uh, 30, honestly, five, yeah. 35% I mean, strikeout rate. And he was terrible against lefty. Yeah, but he still Even, hit 234 last year, which that's bad. But like you can live with that if it comes with 25 homers and 15 steals, which again is not an outlandish. That That is not a 70th percentile outcome for O'Neill Cruz. Yeah, I just pace out last year's numbers over a full season and you're talking 30, 30, 30 and 20. 30 homers. Yeah, nearly 20 steals. And with a low batting average but not you know not a joey gallo like batting average so it's i am normally somebody who downgrades strikeout guys quite a bit uh just see too much downside for them but you know with with the introduction of, of stat cast and and seeing the effect quality of contact has on overcoming a high strikeout rate remembering that aaron judge who is O'Neal Cruz's corollary in terms of how hard he hits the ball himself. Judge himself was a 30% strikeout mm -hmm. guy when he broke into the league and still hit 270 to 280 consistently. Like I, I'm not that fearful of the downside for O'Neal Cruz. I don't know that for sure that he's going to meet the full extent of his upside this year, but he, like I was saying for Corey Seager, uh, within this range of shortstops, kind of the, 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 middle of the draft sort of targets at the position. O'Neill Cruz, like Seager, is somebody that I'm willing to go the extra round for, especially in 5x5 five five or Roto Leagues. But even in points leagues, I, I find he tends to be downgraded too much, and yeah. I love drafting him there. Too. Like Sometimes he'll slip to round 12, round 13, and for the upside, I'll And, and this is one on of that. those cases where, like, Corey Seager, you know, if everything goes right, it's a really good player but it's probably 330. O'Neill Cruz, like, it's it's just exponential upside. It's it's that, like, if the strikeout rate drops to 20 to 30%, he's probably a 260 hitter. But if it drops to 27%, which is still pretty bad. It, it was below 25% in the minors. Yeah, if it does, I mean, you're talking about, it's not unreal, like, you can't really put a ceiling on it. Again, this this might be the last chance to draft O'Neill Cruz outside of the top 20. Chris, uh, you mentioned if he just lowers the strikeout rate to 30%, that's something O'Neill Cruz did in September. Mm -hmm. and his batting average was 288. So yep. Look, that's he he has the the skill set to be a helpful batting average source, even if he strikes out a lot. Scott, I'm likely to fade. Uh, Dansby Swanson and Xander Bogarts, two names here who are in new locations. Swanson, it's you're you're buying off of a career year. The price isn't terrible at seventy three point five as the ADP, but going from the Braves stack lineup to the Chicago Cubs now, just kind of worry about that. And he kind of fell off in the second half last year too. Bogarts, there's a lot of underlying numbers, Scott, here that are not great, specifically stat cast and how hard he hits the ball. The only re the only point that I could make in favor of Bogarts is the lineup, man. I mean, just hitting fourth for a lineup that includes Tatis, Soto, and Manny Machado is absolutely tantalizing. So I'm probably out on both, but I guess that's the semi case for Bogarts. Yeah, I, I mean, it's... I, I wouldn't say I'm out on either. It's just I'm basically as high on Willie Adamas as I am on these two. I'm basically as high on Cor Carlos Correa as yep. these two. And they go a lot later. They tend to go a lot later. So it like I, I 
if it happens to work out that somebody else takes Willie Adamas or Carlos Correa ahead of Swanson or Bogarts, okay, fine, give me those two. I I, I like them better in a you know on pure ranking level, but you know I, I'm probably not going to end up with that much of them. Xander's Xander's such a weird player because like he is so consistently inconsistent. Like he is consistently one of the six best shortstops in fantasy, like pretty much every year. But it's like he's a different player every year. Like some years he's he's usually really good in batting average, but some years he's a good power hitter. Some years he drives in a bunch of runs. It, it's like it, I like him because there it feels like there's a lot of contingency plans with him. Like there aren't a lot of ways things can go wrong for Xander Bogarts. Whereas like Dansby Swanson, I feel like uh, you can definitely see that like if the strikeout rate from last season remains and he takes a step back with quality of contact, like he definitely doesn't have that consistent track record. I will say, you know, since, since the people want more points league analysis, Xander Bogarts is the better points league option, better plate discipline, uh, where he falls shorts in home in home runs. He'll probably give you a lot of doubles Mm -hmm. and Swanson is the better Roto option clearly the better base dealer of the two. And I would say the better, better power hitter at this point of the two as well. Uh, Let's just quickly talk about Wander Franco here dealt with a quad injury that popped up in April. I'm not sure that he was ever right after that. I I feel like I watched games where he was, he just didn't look right. He didn't look like himself. And I feel like, you know, announcers would allude to it too. I had a hamate bone injury in July. So pretty much a lost season for Wander Franco, but Chris, Early in the season, it, it kind of looked like he was breaking mm-hmm. out. I mean, in April, a monster April, th- 313 batting average, four homers, eight doubles, three steals, a 90.7 mile per hour average exit velocity. I just don't know if was he about to break out and the injuries kind of knocked him off or was it just, just some kind of small sample flukiness? And that's kind of where I get confused on whether to draft Wander Franco or not. I, I think... The answer is it doesn't really matter because he's gotten cheap enough where it's worth betting on the upside. Now I don't necessarily make that bet all that often, but I have drafted Wander Franco a couple times this year. Whereas I don't think I drafted him at all a year ago when he was going, you know, 30 or 40 spots higher. Um, He hasn't shown the elite upside yet. You know, even in flashes outside of really April where he was hitting the ball harder and that was a good sign. His, Max Exavilo early on was much higher than yet the hardest hit of his ball of his career, like three days into last season or something. And so there's definitely still reasons to be optimistic, but because he's cheaper, I can live with that. He might only be a 15, 15 guy with a 285 average. All right. Well, now, hang on, ahead, hang on. I got to do this. Uh-oh. I'm going to get annoying about this, Go ahead. but Wander Franco is more than any other shortstop is the player whose value improves the most mm-hmm. in points leagues. His plate discipline is phenomenal, especially the strikeout rate. I mean, he he's it's, it's like you know he's he's basically Juan Soto as far as that goes. Nine, he doesn't walk that much, but yeah, nine point six percent K rate. That would have been third best if he qualified. Right. So tons of contact, and that helps make up for any shortfalls in the power department. It more than makes up for it. I also feel more confident now than I did a year ago that Wander Franco is going to be a pretty good base stealer. Uh, he he had eight. He was eight for eight in steals in only eighty three games last year. If you you're you know you're translating that to the new stolen base environment that I expect to see, it's a good chance he's a twenty steal guy. Uh, so he might be a fifteen homer, twenty steal guy. With a you know good batting average because he strikes out so little, that would make him better than Xander Bogarts probably. So uh, talking the, to five by five context, again. the the counterpoint to that would be if he doesn't take a big step forward as a as a hitter, like especially as a power hitter. Are we talking about the difference between him and Nico Horner being four home runs and everything else being kind of similar? I, clearly, he has more upside. I think Nico Horner is an incredibly limited player, but like right. the strikeout rate, very similar. 11% like, for Nico Horner last season. He hit 290, I think. Yeah. Um, 20 steals in not full playing time. So like the the downside for Nico Horner, I think, is wider because he might lose his job. Wander yeah, Franco's well, not well, going to. But Wander Franco's downside is basically Nico Horner. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. It's just the the most likely outcome for the two of them might be fairly similar as well. Uh, I was going to say, I think Nico Horner's season from last year might be close to his ceiling. Maybe I'm selling him short, but it feels like that is... No, I think that's fair. Maybe that's close to Wander Franco's floor, right? Like if everything kind of like just falls apart for Wander Franco, he's probably Nico Horner, but the upside still is, is well, massive for Wander Franco. I mean, what he's done so far is not that impressive. You no, know, it is no, worth establishing that like Wander Franco's floor is high, but it's not, I don't know, like 13 home runs and 10 steals in, in 153 games so far. We should, we should properly quantify what one, like Wander Franco's kind of been Gene Segura so for, far. For a guy who still hasn't turned. Oh yeah. He's not 22 yet. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the, he's, I think the gap between his floor and his 50th percentile outcomes probably pretty slim. And then there's a much higher ceiling as well. I think that's the case for Wanda Franco. All right, let's take a break. We have one more pod this week, a mailbag that's coming up tomorrow. So make sure to tune in. That will be myself and the Chris I, the Towers and the Welsh. Also, make sure to listen to Fantasy Baseball Today in 5. It is a it is our five-minute podcast, and we're going to start doing some player profiles in that feed. So if you want to hear about a certain player, you can email us a name at fantasybaseball at cbsi.com put player profile in the subject line and let us know who you want us to talk about or drop a five-star rating on Apple and leave a name in the review. Let's take a break and we'll be back right after this. Why are we stopped? Something bit you. What keeps you up at night? It has to kill you before the next four it's a seven foot tall monster. But you're not so sure he's a bear either. Well, you've never killed anything. That's why you've never had a back before. Italy's best clubs and brightest stars bring show stopping skills and unbelievable thrills in the fight to the finish for the Scudetto. Stream every Serie A match live on Paramount Plus. Let's get into sleepers, breakouts, and busts for the shortstop position. Gents, we have a lot more names to get to, so please, let's make it fast. I do like that there's a lot of overlap here. So, Scott, no, Let's just do two hours. <laughs> Honestly, we could probably do three on this position. <laughs> Scott, you're up. Sleeper at shortstop. All right, my sleeper is the same as yours, Frank. It's <sighs> Ezekiel Tovar of the Rockies, who... Frankly, I'm surprised he's going as late as he is in drafts because he is a high-end prospect who already got his feet wet in the majors last year, which makes it much easier to buy that he's going to make the opening day roster. And it, for Colorado, so he's going to have the advantage of of playing his home games in the bad bit boosting wonderland that is Coors Field. Um, and considering he was a let me look this up he was a 319 hitter between double and triple a last year with uh you know good uh good contact rate in that environment like it how is he not going to hit 300 you know and there are questions about whether his home run pace 14 and 71 games whether that'll translate to the majors but it certainly helps his case if he's playing his home games in Colorado. And by the way, he was also 17 for 20 on stolen bases in those 71 games. So I think, especially given that home environment, there's potentially five category potential here for Tovar. Power is the most questionable of those five categories. And I still say that's the most important uh, thing a hitter can do in fantasy is hit for power. But like if if you do miss out on that loaded mid tier at shortstop that includes the Xander Bogarts and Carlos Correa's and Willie Adams, all of them, like Tovar is the one you want to target because I think of of those remaining after that group, he's the one with with the most upside and the best opportunity to make good on that upside. Scott, you're right. I mean, he he's simply just going too late for an everyday Rockies player not even mentioning the upside. So then that only adds to it. I mean, the ADP is 288, so it's just so late. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, devil's advocate, because uh, I, I have him ranked 115 spots higher than his ADP, so I'm right there with you. He's a top 20 shortstop for me in the rankings. But the Rockies have not earned the benefit of the doubt. 
Ezekiel Tovar is not considered a dramatically better prospect than Brendan Rodgers was coming up. The Rockies really haven't developed an average major leaguer among their young players since Trevor Story. So, like, there might just be something about that team that is just fundamentally broken. That being said, everything you guys said is, is 100%. Like, Bre- man, Brennan Rogers he hit 322 in AAA, which is, you know, it was Albuquerque, so inflated, but Coors Field is also inflated, and he has a 266 batting average in the majors so far. So it just... Yeah. I mean, it's, prospects sometimes flop. I don't know that it's right, fair to yeah. compare Tovar, but... Prospects flop. The Rockies have not earned the benefit of the doubt. If anything, they've probably earned whatever the opposite of the benefit of the doubt is, the benefit of the skepticism, perhaps. <laughs> um, but no, I'm with you. I, I I think he's well worth drafting inside of the top 200. All right, Chris. Well, we'll stick with you here for another sleeper. Who you got? CJ Abrams, who... It feels like he's been around for a while, but he's, I don't think he's turned, I don't think he turns 22 until May. Uh, He played 90 games in the majors, but he's only played 204 games as a professional total. He's played like 80 games between double A and triple A. He's hit over 300 at those two levels. He's produced so far in his professional career outside of the majors. And he's been incredibly young when he's gotten the call. So I still think CJ Abrams is someone who, you know, the the underlying numbers it, at the major league level do not suggest that there is a breakout imminent, but this might be a situation where he was just overmatched as a 21-year-old who got traded midseason, but there's still 70-grade speed, very good contact skills. People think he will hit for power eventually. So definitely someone, I think he's going even later than uh, – Tovar. So I think CJ Abrams is actually he's going a little earlier, at least in NFC drafts, which is surprising. I would rather have Tovar, but uh both of them are in like the 20-ish range for me at shortstop. I, I like taking a late round uh flyer on both of them. Yeah, even in fantasy pros, Abrams is going at 268.5. So just ahead of Tovar. I agree. I'd rather have Tovar, but I do like Abrams. If you play in a, a categories league and you need a middle infielder, you need speed and maybe a little batting average later on. Uh, it's an interesting skill set. He's he's, he's got to up up that steals rate if he's gonna like yeah. Abrams' best attribute is his speed. So if he yeah. doesn't take advantage of it the way he didn't as a rookie last year, then yeah, but he's he's never gonna live up to his upside. But hopefully he, he will. He does have thirty three stolen base attempts between double A AA and triple A in just eighty games. So you know, yeah, that's he he ran there at least. Yep. Small sample, but final 28 games with the Nationals. Abrams hit 314 with five steals. That is a 26 steal pace over 150. We'd probably need even more than that, honestly. Like 30 plus steals would be huh, an ideal outcome for CJ Abrams. Scott, give me a breakout at shortstop. Uh, oh, well, come on. We already talked about this name. So I wanted to go last because here's what happened. So before the show, you want us to put in the rundown our picks for each of these. And I was, I, I went last and I was thinking, okay, I'll. I can't decide between O'Neill Cruz and Corey Seager, so I'll let you guys pick, and whoever you don't pick, that's the one I'll pick. Well, Chris, you picked O'Neill Cruz, and Frank, you picked Corey Seager. So Who we I'm already just talked saying, about. O'Neill Cruz and Corey Seager. Um, I do want to add one little fact about uh, O'Neill Cruz that I didn't get to earlier, and that's well, well, Chris mentioned he has he's the owner of the hardest hit ball in Statcast history. He also already has three batted balls of more than 118 miles per hour. Aaron Judge in his career has only 14 balls hit that hard. Yeah. So Cruz, less than a full season, already up to three. Judge, who, by the way, is second all time with those 14, a distant second to jump. Yeah, Stan team. has like 60. He's yeah. a freak. Uh, but you know the the kind of pace Cruz is on, maybe he yeah. could challenge Dan. So yeah, I mean, just just incredible quality of contact for this guy. Also, I believe he had the did he have the hardest infield th- the the highest velocity infield throw last season as well? Perhaps he had like a ninety nine mile per hour throw or something out of it. There, there, there was a highlight. He's yeah. yeah, he's he's so much fun. He O'Neill Cruz is a freak. <laughs> no matter part of it, you know, part of it is just like he's so much fun that like. Get that guy on your team so that you have a reason to watch the Pirates. And he's like six foot seven. It's just such an interesting player to watch, just gallivant around the infield. Uh, 
I'll do a quick shout out to Oswald Peraza. He's like my pseudo breakout here. He's going very late in drafts, but uh, Yankees top prospect and well, not their top one of their top prospects. And he got off to a slow start in the minors last year, but from June 1st on, he hit 291 with 14 homers and 22 steals. I think he's going to be their starting shortstop on opening day. You know, there is some risk because if he doesn't perform, he'll get benched. But that's that's the problem is he's not even the best shortstop prospect in his own French organization. This is uh, based on things that I've read. I don't know that Anthony Volpe is going to stick at shortstop. Maybe that's sure. unfair to him. You know, maybe he's more of a second or third baseman. Regardless, I think it could all work out. If Peraza hits, he's going to play. Yeah. And if he hits, you know, we could see like 15 homers, 15 steals or even 2020 if it all works out this year. So just wanted to throw his name out there. A bust at the position. We'll start with Chris. Uh, Bobby Witt, who we'll talk about more at third base, but it's just, it comes down to the price. If he goes in the first round, I hate him. If he goes in the late second or early third, like he does a lot of the times when we're drafting, I, I think he's fine. Um, yeah. He's a volatile player who has a relatively high floor, which is a weird combination. It's, you know, sort of O'Neill Cruz ish. Um, but I think, you know, Witt is being drafted in some leagues, specifically NFC formats, where his ADP is like eight. That's the ceiling. Yeah, that's uh, that's honestly, I don't, I don't remember a first round pick that seemed more ridiculous to me than than Bobby Witt. Well, yeah, because you year. look at like I, I went through and I, it was like Bo Bichette and Fernando Tatis, and there was someone, one of the other. There's always one guy who gets pushed up way higher than their production would make you think. And Bobby Witt's been by far his rookie season was by far the worst of the three. So I, I, I have trouble if it's a first round, if it's truly a first round price, which depends on who you're drafting with, mm -hmm. I can't justify it. If it's, you know, second or third, then it's fine. We'll, we'll get into him more at third base, I'm sure, because some people are probably wondering why. We'll, we'll get into it at third base. Yeah, that is Bobby Witt Jr. Uh, for me, I have Dansby Swanson as a bus. I already kind of talked about it. Don't like buying off the career year. New team, first year uh, in a big contract as well, a new environment. I, I kind of look to fade those players as well. Look at someone like Javier Baez from last year or even Lindor his first year with the Mets. So just kind of worry about those players. And Scott, speaking of which, you also have one of those as your bus. Yeah, Xander Bogart. So I mentioned at the top that he was uh, one of the shortstops who suffered most from the elimination of the juiced ball. And it makes sense looking at his exit velocity. He's pretty middling, and, and he was somebody I worried about coming into the season. Ended up only hitting 15 home runs for the Red Sox. Ten of those home runs were at home with obviously the very short porch in left field. Um of those 10 he hit at home, I believe eight were over the green monster and one was around Pesky's pole, which is also very close, a uh, very close right field. Um, so now he's going to San Diego, which I don't think is going to be nearly as advantageous. It's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from mm -hmm. Fenway Park in, in terms of its benefits for right-handed hitters. I think uh, just sort of his natural hit tool Xander Bogarts is, is probably a safe bet for batting average still. And as you pointed out, Frank, he's in a good lineup. So RBI runs should be fine. I think just extra base hits in general will be good enough to make him a, uh, a quality starter in points league still. But I worry that we're never going to see him hit 20 home runs again. Like I said, 15 last year. And my expectation going forward might be closer to a dozen than 20 like you know maybe it's 15 again but like it, it could be less than 15 so uh specifically in five by five leagues i i wonder if xander bogart's um you know he's going well ahead of carlos correa but does he even belong in the same tier as carlos correa i think that's a fair question I, i'm looking forward to a 11 homer 110 rbi season for xander bogart's yeah, that would be something just give me a name, guys. All things considered, the shortstop that you will target most is? Since we can't all say O'Neill Cruz and Corey Seager, I'll say Carlos Correa. Probably going to be Willie Adamas just from a tier standpoint. Like he's the, I'm giving you more than a name. He's the shortstop who, uh, who I think is in that giant mid-round tier who tends to go the latest. 
Yep. And it's Corey Seager for me, but I agree, Chris. I, I often wind up with a lot of Carlos Correa just kind of stacking all the other positions and waiting for him because, you know, he's kind of the last one there. Uh, shortstop prospects that you need to know for this year. We already spoke about Ezekiel Tovar with the Rockies and Oswald Peraza with the Yankees. It's got three more names here. Anthony Volpe also with the Yankees. Ellie De La Cruz with the Reds, who was a big riser last year. Monster power and speed. And Jordan Lawler, who was a former first-round pick in 2021. I think that we're likely to see Volpe sooner than the other two. Yep. But I think maybe like in August, September, call up for, for De La Cruz and, and Lawler. Yeah, Volpe could be up very early. I think specifically in deeper Roto Leagues, he deserves late-round looks. Uh, like I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility he could make the opening day roster, though the Yankees do have a lot of infielders, a lot of older guys, a lot of low-upside guys who they'll probably want to give the first shot. I want... Like I, I totally expect by season's end, it'll they'll be playing Peraza and Volpe up the middle, or maybe Volpe at third base. That's uh, outcome for him. Big steals guy, and uh, good power too. Somebody who, if you look at the minor league numbers, you might be underwhelmed because he had a low batting average, was terrible at the start of last year. Mm -hmm. But um, his, you know, there's a lot more enthusiasm for him than you might guess from the numbers. Uh, Ellie De La Cruz, I want to mention him too because. Like he, he's so much like uh, O'Neill Cruz. Like he's the next O'Neill Cruz in terms of being a freakishly tall shortstop who just has insane batted ball metrics and ton of athleticism. Going to hit for a lot of power, a lot of speed, but the strikeout rate is scary. Um, so it, it hasn't mattered in the minors. He's killed it. Like his production is even has been even better than Cruz's there, but. You know, we'll we'll see how the rest of his development goes. All right, let's get back into ADP. We have two names going between picks ninety and one hundred. Willie Adamas at ninety four point five, and Tim Anderson at pick ninety six. Chris, I like both of these names a lot. It seems like they're they always just kind of like last later on into drafts, and I think both are extremely serviceable. Last year, Willie Adamas had. Uh, 30 home runs, only 23 batters hit 30 or more home runs. Only two came from shortstop. That was Adamus and Corey Seager. Tim Anderson, the issue is that he has not been able to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. He has missed 32% of his available games since the start of 2019. But when he was healthy last year, the first two months of the season, he hit 356 with five home runs and eight steals. That's still a really productive player. We just need him to stay on the field. So uh, I like both of these guys a lot, Chris. Yeah, Anderson played, what, 79 games, I think, last year? Yep, 79. So you just double his numbers, 12 homers, 26 steals, and the underlying metrics suggest that he was actually quite a bit better than the 12 home runs would make you think. So I don't really think that there's much concern about him as, as far as production. If anything, he's been so reticent to steal, and he's been such a, a high-efficiency stolen base guy that he's one of the guys who I could see really taking a big step forward in stolen bases with the new rules. Um it's just it just comes down to health, and he hasn't played a full season since 2018. I don't think you expect him to play a full season at this point, but if there's a position to take a chance on a guy like this, it's shortstop. So I, I think he lasts too long in nearly every draft that we do. Scott, anything you'd like to add? I know you like Willie Adamas. I do like Willie Adamas, and I mean, you mentioned his points per game average is right up there with you know some of the studs at the positions, Andrew Bogarts, Dansby Swanson. I I put him in the same tier as them. I do Tim Anderson as well. I think Tim Anderson specifically um, stands out in, in five by five leagues over points mm -hmm. leagues because the plate discipline isn't very good. But they're both part of that giant tier for me, and I'd be just as happy with them as. Um, you know, some of the others we've mentioned, Carlos Correa, et cetera. All right, let's drop down to picks 110 through 120. We see Carlos Correa with an ADP of 110.5. What an eventful offseason it was for Carlos Correa. He was a giant, then he was a Met, and now he's back to the Minnesota Twins. Jeremy Pena has an ADP of 114.5. Uh, Scott, I think I'm much more likely to draft Carlos Correa than I am Jeremy Pena. There is just something about Pena. He just kind of has that it factor. I don't know if it was 
watching baseball in the postseason and seeing how he just kind of went off there and ALCS MVP, World Series MVP, a gold glove as a rookie. And I'll point out, Jeremy Pena, before he got hurt last year, he went on the IL with a left thumb injury in June. He hit 277 with nine home runs and six steals. That is a 25 homer, 16 steal pace over 150 games. He was not anywhere close to that player once he returned after that. So I still think there's a lot more upside, but uh, Pena much better in a categories league than he is in a point six cut. Yeah, I don't share your enthusiasm for him. I mean, he ended up with 22 home runs and 11 steals, which isn't that far off from the 25 16 numbers you mentioned. Uh, terrible plate discipline, 289 OBP as a rookie. And I don't really see that improving. I don't think his quality of contact is good enough for me to picture an enormous ceiling here. I think he's in the same category of, um, for me personally, Ezekiel Tovar in that, like if I miss out on the previous tier, that Willie Adamas, Carlos Correa, Xander Bogarts, et cetera tier. Okay, I'll fall back on Pena. Also another player who, big difference in his value, Roto Leagues versus head-to-head. Because of that terrible plate discipline, he's he's junk in points leagues. Chris, we talked about Correa a lot this offseason because of all the various emergency podcasts. Uh, one thing we constantly brought up was the 70 runs and 64 RBI. Mm-hmm. They just don't mirror the type of player that he was, as productive as a hitter as Correa was last season. So assuming you know any of the Twins could stay healthy in their lineup this year, I am expecting a full bounce back in, in terms of the runs and RBI production. Yeah, I'll take the over on both. Um, I, I think he'll probably be closer to 90 than he is to the numbers he had last year in both categories. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, and you know, stop me if you heard this before, but I'm not really too concerned about the injury concerns <laughs> about Carlos Correa. I know that's kind of my thing, but like he has, I don't think, I, I think he hasn't missed a game with an ankle injury since like 2015. I might be making that up. That might be too far back, but it's been a long time. It was like one of his first two seasons in the majors. The concern here seems to be the long-term stability and health of his ankle. Not necessarily that he's going to mess it up this year. He could, you know, but I generally don't have too much concern about that for 2023. I guess there's a little bit of elevated injury risk, but like, I don't know if this change should change how we view him in the short term. I think he's, A very good player. I don't really understand the gap in his price here. I think it's even bigger in uh, NFC leagues, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, Yeah, 119.7. I just, I think he belongs with Xander Bogarts and Dansby Swanson. Like, I don't really see that much difference between him and Dansby Swanson. Swanson will steal some bases, but I think Correa might be better than him you know, at, at everything else. Yeah. It just yeah, comes I mean, down to steals. That's why yeah. he goes late. Like, you're not going to get any speed from Correa, but a 280 plus hitter with 20 to 25 home runs. That's, that's still really valuable. And, and I think it's, I think that's an overemphasis on steals. I, I think it might be a little more to it than that because yeah, I, I, I mean, the big thing that stands out for me is the 64 RBI and 70 runs, which is mm-hmm. just law of averages. Like there's no way with his, Perform, the way he performs at the plate, that it could possibly be yeah. that low. Again, the way he performs in the plate and the spot he bats in in the lineup, this seems like the biggest run in RBI fluke of all time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you give him 20 more of each of those, uh, Carlos no, there, Correa is looking pretty studly. There's no question Correa versus Pena for me. Oh, no. They're, they're, they're in different tiers. Yeah, they're completely different. There might be like a tier and a half, maybe two tiers between them. After Jeremy Pena goes, we have two very similar profiles between picks 120 and 160. So this is a big range. There's 40 picks here, and there's only two pure shortstops. I think you know there was some second baseman involved here. We spoke about them on yesterday's podcast. They're probably going to be drafted as second baseman. Ahmed Rosario has an ADP of 129.5. Nico Horner has an ADP of 156.5. Chris, I think they're very similar. You know, good batting average, 10-ish home runs going to give you 18 to 20 steals. You know, they make a lot of contact. They're solid. They're not going to wow you, but very similar profiles, I feel like, for Rosario and Horner. Both could, I think, benefit, especially from the new rules, because they're they're both very efficient base stealers. And so that's one thing is that you could just see them both be much more like 
Rosario's a guy who has not run very much in his major league career. I mean, back in 2020, he played 46 games and had no steals, which is just stunning. Um, 96th percentile sprints. Yeah. Horner's not quite as fast, 92nd, but you're splitting hairs at that point. I prefer Horner. Uh, I think the the hit tool is a little more, uh, I buy it a little more. So I, I'm I'm with him there, but I think they're both fairly similar players. Yeah. Yeah. Similar, like beneficial in batting average, mm-hmm. not a complete zero in home runs. They're not very good. And yeah, and I could agree. be, could be like, could very, both of them could very easily be six homer guys and it wouldn't surprise me. I think, and, and, and Frank, you've given me a hard time in the past for not caring for Ahmed Rosario. And if, if, if his stat line holds steady, I, I still think, you know, there's not a lot to get excited about here, but I do think there's a scenario as fast as he is. And as uh, much as I expect runners will be encouraged to run this year, he could end up being a better version of Tommy Edmond. I think that's within the realm of possibility for Ahmed Rosario. So I doubt I'm going to draft him in like a head to head lineup league with no middle infield spots. But if you're talking about a roto league with that middle infield spot, you know, if, if, you know, if I, if I don't fill that middle infield spot early enough, then I'm totally cool with taking Ahmed Rosario or Nico Horner at this price. Scott doesn't hate Ahmed Rosario after all. Who would have thunk it? He's just, he just kind of gets it done. 67th overall in Roto last year. The ADP is 129. So it just seems a little disrespected for Ahmed Rosario. Uh, we've got two names going from picks 180 to 200. Javier Baez with an ADP of 189 and Jorge Mateo at 195.5. Baez last year, a terrible first season with the Tigers. He hit 238 with 17 home runs, nine steals, and a 671 OPS. Another one that dealt with a thumb injury in April, and maybe it just kind of derailed the rest of his season after that. I mean, think about it. Your thumb is so pivotal to gripping the bat and being able to swing consistently and hard. It seems like a fairly reasonable excuse, and also the Tigers were just terrible. So, Chris, is there any hope here on a bounce back for Javier Baez? Yeah, we've been here before. Yes. I mean, that, that's always the thing with Javier Baez is we have seen these kinds of stretches from him. He was a disaster in 2020, uh, and he bounced back with, you know, one of the better career seasons of his career in 2021. So it would not surprise me at all if we're talking about him in the same breath as we're talking about Carlos Correa and those guys a, a year from now. The The quality of contact metrics all took a dive last year, though. You know, it is worth noting that his max eggs of velo fell four and a half miles per hour. He's consistently been one of the best in the majors last in, in that last year. He was just okay. Uh, and his average exit velocity, hard hit rate, all the consistency metrics just went in the toilet. And if he doesn't get that stuff back, then, you know, it doesn't, nothing else matters. I, I have some faith that he will, but it's, you know, I, I can't I, point to anything except his track record to say that I expect it. I would say that my hope for a Javier Baez bounce back. I, I think it's I think it's less likely to happen than that it will happen. But at this point, if you still need a shortstop, mm-hmm. Javier Baez is your last best hope for it. So you might as well just take him and hope for the best. And if you do want some reason to be encouraged. He did save his best for last last year in September, hit 293 with six home runs, more than a third of his season total in that final month. And so, also maybe should benefit from Comerica Park being yeah, a lot of his power is slightly the less field. cavernous. Well, not was, even just opposite field. He just he hits a ton of power to center. Yeah. And, and that's and that was, really where because. Comerica Park, I think it like it was listed at 420 feet, but it was actually like 430. It was like mislabeled, and but somehow their center field wall was mislabeled. Yeah, and so it's... they're like moving it into the correct position. It'll still be one of the deepest center fields in baseball, but they are both it... lowering the fences and moving center field in. It, they that stadium wasted Nick Castellanos's prime. Yes, and I saw people cite stats where. Comerica Park routinely, year in and year out, has the most barrels that do not go mm-hmm. for home runs. They just turn into outs or doubles. But 
It's yeah. unfortunate because in another ballpark, a lot of those barrels are I mean, two home runs. Miguel Cabrera might have hit 600 home runs in a, in a normal ball, ball, ballpark. Who's to say? I brought up the name Jorge Mateo. His ADP is 195.5. He had 35 steals last year, and he That's finished it. 119th in Roto. <laughs> that was the second most in baseball. Let's kind of lump them in together, Chris, with a name you compared him to last year, Adalberto Mondesi. Has an ADP of 224.5. Traded to the Red Sox this offseason. He suffered a torn ACL in late April. Might not be ready for the start of the season. Do you have any hope in Adalberto Montesi or, <laughs> or I guess, Jorge Mateo at this point? Uh, I'm not sure either one of them is an everyday player for their respective teams. Montesi, the most recent update was that he's probably not going to be ready for opening day uh, coming back from that torn ACL. Like it remains a boomer bust profile. I just don't know how much boom is left coming off an injury like this. Like if he's not uh, a next level athlete, he's never been a good baseball player. So I, yeah, it's, it's hard to get excited. I, he's going so late that there's no risk in it, but I, I can't get excited about the prospect of drafting him even 220th. Two prospects going from picks 260 to 290. We spoke about CJ Abrams with an ADP of 268.5. Ezekiel Tofar at 288. The rest I got from NFBC the last two weeks because, uh, frankly, Fantasy Pros was just missing a few names. Um, Oswald Peraza, 309.3. Luis Garcia from the Nationals, 357.1. Anthony Volpe at 432.1. And Elvis Andrews, who remains unsigned, a league winner last year, like a career renaissance in the second half. He was performing like, you know, a, a first round player. He was awesome. He doesn't have a team right now. Uh, Scott, very deep names, but Peraza, Luis Garcia, Volpe, Elvis Andrews. Slight exaggeration there with Andrews, but he was certainly started in most leagues, I would assume. Scott, he was, September. he was really, really good. I was, you know, he had like 270 with the White Sox, but yes, <laughs> it was, it was worth starting him in fantasy. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly it doesn't look like he's going to be in a position for a bats to begin this season. So no reason to draft him really. And while I got excited about Luis, Luis Garcia at times last year, the final product was pretty underwhelming. And I, you know, I, I can't really muster much enthusiasm for him on draft day. The two Yankees here are really where I'm looking, especially Peraza since you know, he's much more likely than Volpe to make the everyday roster. I think Volpe has more upside overall, but Peraza's minor league production was pretty impressive in its own right. And, um, you know, we'll see how much time he ends up getting with Isaiah Kiner Falefa and Glaber Torres up the middle. Obviously, Kiner Falefa is the one who, you know, could, could stand to get out of the way for Peraza. Um, I think it's likely enough that he'll claim the spot early enough that an ADP outside the top 300 is way too low, way too low. We need to, we need to draft Peraza earlier than this. I agree completely. Scott Kiner Falefa, get him out of here. We're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching fantasy baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.